Thank you very much, uh, Professor Pons, uh, professors, uh, ladies and gentlemen, President. Thank you for inviting me to this very interesting occasion. I think uh, um, the, the discussion about the relevance uh, of uh, the designation of a national language or, of, or an official language is, uh, is, is, um, is an important one. And uh, at the end of my presentation, I will uh, I hopefully come to the to the conclusion that uh, there should be more countries with several languages designated as national ones or official ones. Uh, but uh, let me uh, present, upon the request of, of, of the organizers, the system in Finland. And, and I, I should stop by, by giving some, some facts uh, of an empirical nature. At the moment, um, the population of Finland is 5.5 million, which is... Uh, a fraction of some other countries. <laughs> uh, the number of Swedish people is currently 295,000 inhabitants, which is, f I think, 5.4% of the total population. So, um, so um, the Swedish speakers are far less in proportion than Finnish speakers. However, in numbers, more or less the same as they used to be when the um, linguistic system was first uh, introduced and set, put into place constitutionally um, around the time of independence of Finland in 1919-1920. In so let me continue from that uh, to uh, a short historical expose of, uh, of Finland just to explain from where we come to the situation where we are right now. Um, back in the distant history, um, Places that now are known as the state of Finland and the state of Sweden, they used to be rather, well, nobody knew what they were actually, and there were no state uh, present uh, for a long time, but until the 14th century perhaps. Uh, but those areas that, that we know, now know as, as, as Sweden and Finland, they started to integrate under some sort of a crown uh, in, the, in the 11th, 12th century. And... Uh, because the, the proportions of population in terms of language were more or less uh, perhaps uh, around 80% 80, 80 Swedish speakers, 20% Finnish speakers. The, the language was by default Swedish in this kingdom of, uh, kingdom of Sweden that actually saw independence in, in 1520. Uh, but that was not the monolithic uh, existence. Uh, but rather, interestingly, uh, in the 18th century, um, there, some cracks started to appear in that, in that uh, facade. Since 1743, for instance, the value on banks was written in two languages, Swedish and Finnish. Of course, there were the numbers also, but, but, but the value was also written out. And uh, the Code of Laws of 1734, adopted um, in Swedish, obviously, in the, in the Swedish diet, that was translated into Finnish very soon and published in, in 1759 in Finnish so that people who were approaching the law could read it in their own language. Of course, the, the Bible had been translated already in the, in the 16th century, speaking about, speaking about ecclesiastical things. And uh, also uh, in the Swedish diet, which uh, by default, I say, say uh, used Swedish as the language of legislation, there were certain certain representatives or a number of, of representatives from Finland and in particular uh, in the fourth in the landed peasants um, there were um, needs uh, of, of, uh, of translation interpretation so from from the 1760s there was a secretary uh, designated for that sort of of, of translations and, and interpretations so that the Finnish speaking members of the uh, peasants, landed peasants in the Swedish diet could participate in their own language. So we have a kind of a, an infrastructure developing early on, which is, uh, which is interesting. Obviously, Sweden became very nationalistic in the wake of, of national romanticism in the 19th century, 1850s and so on. I won't talk about that. But I will uh, just say that in Finland, this... Uh, this uh, situation with Swedish by default continued when Finland was separated from Sweden as an entity and made into a, an autonomous part of the Russian uh, uh, Empire. Um, because the, the, the emperor uh, decided to, 
continue the, the validity of Swedish law and language, Swedish law rather, and, and by default also Swedish language. Uh, but that, uh, that grew to become a kind of a, of a, of a, of a source of, of uh, um, discontention, uh, in particular amongst those predominantly Swedish-speaking uh, elite who studied in Germany and got influenced by national romanticism. They started to think that, well, there is a national romantic uh, possibility in Finland by, by uh, making Finnish uh, also a language of, of some, um, some um, official use. So in 1863, um, upon the proposal of a, of a Finnish um, well-educated, in Germany, well-educated person, uh, uh, originally Swedish-speaking, uh, the, the Tsar, the Emperor of Russia, decided to give a so-called language decree, which decreed that there should be equality between Finnish and Swedish in administration and in courts. And there was a 20-year um, um, period of implementation within, with which that was, was done. And, and also that precipitated the diet, uh, which, uh, which uh, got that similar uh, rule in, 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 in the beginning of the 20th century. So that when, um, when um, universal suffrage, an equal vote, was introduced in 1906, the parliament from that point of view from that point on, actually did everything in both Finnish and Swedish. And, and this uh, was the situation when Finland uh, came to the point of, of becoming independent. Nobody had actually foreseen that, but uh, the Russian Empire was, was collapsing and it was very easy then to, to just uh, declare uh, independence. Uh, in that juncture, uh, the existing uh, bilingual system was continued. In fact, the Declaration of Independence was given in the two languages, Finnish and Swedish, by the government. Um, but um, at the constitutional level, this was reflected only in 1919, um, when the first, uh, first, so to say, comprehensive constitutional act, the Formal Government Act, was, was, uh, was passed. And, and Eva, please manage my time. Tell me when I need to stop. Um, which uh, established this principle of two national languages in section 14, uh, subsection 1. Um, then it also implemented that in, in an interesting way by a combination of an individual principle or a personality principle on the one hand and the territoriality principle on the other hand. So the Finnish linguistic system is actually is a combination of the two. There's an individual right, but it is territorially managed at the regional level and the local government level. So we have, uh, we have two, different, uh, two different approaches. Uh, when we deal with national authorities, uh, the national authorities, central government authorities, are bilingual throughout the country. So uh, the national... I'll explain that a bit later. What was uh, uh, inserted uh, in addition to, to this uh, territoriality pr principle uh, on the top of Article 14 came in, in Section 50 of the Formal Government Act, but there was also a very interesting provision which dealt with a substantive area, um, that of military service, when the right was given under the Constitution to do military service either in Finnish or in Swedish, depending on which was the language, uh, mother tongue of, of yours. Um, this um, uh, bilingualism was then uh, continued also in the Parliament uh, Act, which, which came in in 1928 and, and had already been in place actually from 1906 when, when the universal suffrage was introduced. Um, laws would also be passed in Finnish and Swedish. This is the, the starting point. What is not known is that this uh, linguistic setup of Finland actually was also part of, of uh, Finland becoming member of the, in the international community. Namely, when Finland became independent in 1917, it was important, uh, well, in the aftermath of uh, the First World War, uh, to become also um, recognized by other countries, in particular by the League of Nations, which, is, which was uh, premised on, on becoming member of the League of Nations. 
And at that juncture, uh, like in 1920, 1921, uh, many countries wanted to become members of the League of Nations, in particular a lot of new countries, newly independent countries, amongst them Finland. But Finland did not want to regard itself uh, a newly independent country, but rather a country that a state had, that, that had existed already from 1808 or something of that sort. So that was the, the, the point. What is not known is that this, this discussion was going on uh, parallel to what is known, that is the Åland Islands question, uh, whether Finland or Sweden would have the Åland Islands and whether uh, there should be some linguistic guarantees for the Åland Islanders. Everybody knows that, but almost nobody knows that, that at that same time, in July, um, in, in the summer of 1921, the League of Nations also decided not to require of Finland any linguistic guarantees of the same sort as were required by uh, all the other new states that wanted to become members of the League of Nations. Um, this is um, an interesting deviation from the praxis. Um, and I think uh, the reason why the linguistic guarantees were not required from Finland is, uh, is actually... Um, or it, I don't think so, it is actually recorded in the, in, the, in the documentation, is that the constitution of Finland already provided so good guarantees for, for minorities, as it was said, uh, that no additional minority treaty or minority declaration um, from, from Finland would, could, could add anything on the top of that. So therefore, uh, the League of Nations declined to uh, require from Finland any additional guarantees. Other countries, however, from Estonia through Latvia, Lithuania, down to the, to the, to, through Europe to the Mediterranean and also in the, in the Caucasus, they were required to give all sorts of minority guarantees, by which somehow the minorities in the territories were implicated as a possible fifth column or something. You could blame all sorts of national national uh, uh, mishaps on, on, on the minority. And, and, and also, interestingly, those countries, all of them almost, turned very authoritarian in the 1920s and 1930s. I'm not, I have no evidence, uh, but only speculation, to say that, uh, that, that this sort of, um, of um, minority, not rather, uh, arrangement with national languages actually might have saved Finland from this tendency to become authoritarian in the 1920s and 30s, which meant that, for instance, in Finland throughout the Second World War, the parliament, a freely elected parliament, was in session. Um, okay, many of the powers were with the, with the government, but nonetheless. So, I mean, there may be a, there may be a kind of a background picture here that, that uh, we need to understand. If you are relaxed in, in, in your in your state creation as concerns how things are, are to be run in different, uh, in different um, uh, fields of life, and you don't uh, give way to the idea of nationalism, then you might actually uh, do a service to democracy. I'm not sure about this. This is total speculation, but, uh, but I leave it to you to judge. Anyway, um, this arrangement was carried over to the new constitution, actually already in 1995, when the list of, of, of constitutional rights was reformed. Um, then Article 14 already got uh, this uh, fashion you have before you now. Uh, and this, <coughs> this um, formulation of, of Article 14 was carried over to the, to the constitution we have in force in Finland today, which is now Section 17. It, um, is entitled Right to One's Language and Culture. And I will break this down into, into, its, um, into its part, where the first, <coughs> excuse me, first section deals with the principle of national languages, uh, in, uh, establishing Finnish and Swedish as the ones. You understand uh, that when this was first enacted in, in, in 1919, um, it was not straightforward. When the drafting of the constitution was going on, this provision was um, sent back to the drafting committee several times. 
and 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 um, at at the end it got the fashion which uh, was which could be approved by a majority of the 200 members of parliament um, in the drafting stage and finally it was included in the Finnish constitution of 1919 by a qualified majority of two-thirds so I think uh, this is a kind of a social contract I should say in particular if we count in or drag in the support of the 1921 um, <coughs> Uh, debate within the League of Nations. I think I should want to call this a social contract. This is an important provision from that point of view. And this principle of two national languages actually contains uh, two uh, sub-principles. It contains the principle of that the country is officially bilingual, so the two languages are official, um, and also that the two languages are equal between themselves. Um, this has consequences also at the level of the population. Speakers of Finnish and Swedish, uh, they are not posited uh, as a majority in relation to a minority, or a minority in relation to a majority, but rather they are population groups with equal rights. And for uh, all sorts of purposes I might have the time to, to debate today, um, actually these two groups of people or speakers of the two languages should count together as the majority in relation to other groups of, of speakers of languages who would be the minority. Um, but this principle of national uh, languages also has, I think, then consequences for uh, for legislation, including the constitution. And I will now try to outline the consequences, uh, so to say, along the principle of separation of powers, more or less, although not, uh, not uh, entirely. Consequences for the lawmaking powers, consequences for the executive and judicial powers. Um, and one visible uh, Mark of this is uh, uh, section 51, language is used in the parliamentary work, which we know also stems back from, from the distant history. Uh, Finnish and Swedish languages are used in parliamentary work. Um, the government proposing bills to the parliament proposes them in two languages. Okay, they are most drafted in the ministries in Finnish, then translated to Swedish, but in that translation work, by the way, uh, inconsistencies are often uh, detected in the Finnish law, uh, in, in the Finnish version. So the, the translation can go back and say that, well, you know, do you really mean this or do you mean that? And then they amend it. Um, also, the parliament functions in the both languages, but the uh, uh, rules of procedure are written so that, that somehow you get the feeling that Finnish is perhaps the main language. But there's always um, a constant interpretation facility uh, available for persons who, who want to make, make um, statements in Swedish or if they don't understand Finnish uh, that they can get uh, a, um, a translation. All the parliamentary papers, uh, committee reports are issued in, in, in the two languages and the reply of the parliament to the government is given in the two languages. When the parliament has passed the law it is replied in two languages so that the acts, when they have been enacted, have been enacted and also then published by the government, both in Finnish and in Swedish. And this is uh, awfully important because both language versions are equally authoritative. There is no, I mean, if you decide a case, you can use, depending on the person, either of the, one of the language versions. And if there's an inconsistency, you follow the one which is, is, uh, is, is activated uh, by the language of the person. This also means, this whole totality of section 51 and 79, means that the travaux préparatoires are actually emerging in both languages. Uh, this is uh, awfully important in Finland because, uh, as, as with the Swedes, Swedish tradition also, um, bills, government bills are important in laying out what the... The, the meaning of the lawmaker is. So the meaning of the law is often written into the, into the detailed provisions of, of, uh, of, of, the, of the bill. So the courts, 
and also public authorities, when making uh, decisions concerning individuals, they can rely on the law, but also on the travaux préparatoire in trying to sort out what the lawmaker meant with the provision. And that can be done in two languages. Um, a case in a court would arise in the language of the person. If the language is a Finnish speaker, the, the, the court case will arise in Finnish. If the, person, if the person is a Swedish speaker, the court case will arise in, in, in Swedish. Um, if we then go to, to another uh, application of the principle of two national languages, I think seven, uh, section 17 two, the first sentence, constitutes an individual right. Uh, the right to use one's own language before public authorities, uh, courts of law, and to receive all the uh, official documents in the two languages. What is interesting here is that this is not a self-standing and self-executory right, a constitutional right that can be claimed as such, but it requires that the parliament passes acts in order to implement this uh, provision. And uh, on the basis of this, we could say that there's a whole infrastructure of uh, acts of parliament that outline what this sentence means. There's the Language Act, yes. It deals with Finnish and Swedish and how that should be used in public authorities, starting with municipalities, regional authorities of the state, and the central government, including the courts. But the Language Act is just one piece of law. Um, at the same time, there are up to 200 different acts of parliament and also some government decrees that provide uh, rules about how the principle of, of, of uh, the right to use one's own language should be operating before public authorities. So we have, a, have this requirement of an act of parliament um, um, implemented not only through the Language Act, but also through the Health Care Act, through the Act on Social Care, through the Act on Basic Education, Act on High Schools, the Universities Act is loaded with all of this, and, and they may introduce um, deviations or exceptions to the general frame established in the Language Act. So many of the provisions, like, for instance, the Universities Act has its own provisions on language. The Language Act is not at all applied at the universities, but universities have their own linguistic provisions in the Universities Act. If a person wants to become a Finnish citizen, he or she can do so by um, proving a linguistic competence either in Finnish or in Swedish or in the sign language of either the Finnish sign language variety or the Swedish Finnish or the Finnish Swedish uh, sign language. So actually, four languages can do, but 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 the two languages are always treated in parallel to each other. For Education, I should take perhaps also a personal uh, experience, although I cannot uh, obviously uh, match um, the Maltese uh, personal uh, experience in this regard. Um, my children are a um, result of me and my wife. <laughs> um, I am the result of... <laughs> I am the result of, I am the result of a Swedish-speaking mother and a Finnish-speaking father, and and um, and then I married a, a, a woman who is a Swedish speaker in Finland. Her Finnish is quite miserable, actually. <laughs> um, my town, Obu or Turku in Finnish, is under the Language Act a bilingual municipality, and uh, under that act, it 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 has to provide for linguistic services also in the educational sphere. Um, under the Education Act, uh, or, or back act, um, Basic Education Act, in fact, uh, uh, um, municipality, irrespective of if it is bilingual or monolingual, Finnish speaking, uh, has to provide the subjective right to ed basic education in uh, the child's own language, which could be Finnish or Swedish or Sami. Um, and in this case, this means that um, in combination with the Municipalities Act, which is yet another act that, that implements everything um, in, in, in the national languages, that um, 
the schools in which the children go in, for instance, my town, Turku in Finnish, all boys Swedish, the schools are uh, separate for the Swedish speaking and the Finnish speaking um, children. So my children went to uh, a Swedish speaking daycare, they went to a basic, uh, to a to the, to the elementary school, which is Swedish speaking. They went to the secondary school, which is Swedish speaking. My daughter went to the high school, which is Swedish speaking. But my sons who want to do music, they chose to go to a Finnish speaking uh, special uh, high school, which is music as the speciality. That's not provided in Swedish. That might be discriminatory, but uh, let's not talk about that right now. Um, the point is that uh, this um, a requirement of an act of parliament to implement the principle of national languages is very uh, important and it operates in the vertical dimension between the public authorities and the private individual, granting a right to this and that for the individual in either of the two languages. Um, I should then also say that the Municipalities Act responds to this by requiring from bilingual municipalities the creation of a school board in two different varieties. One school board for the Finnish speaking schools and one school board for the Swedish speaking schools. And the Swedish speaking schools, for instance, uh, are, um, have a language requirement for the, for the teachers that requires them to know Swedish at an excellent level only. But they don't have to know a word of Finnish. While in the Finnish speaking schools, which are monolingual um, uh, public authorities, the teachers are under re the requirement to, to, to have an excellent level of proficiency in Finnish, but they don't need necessarily to know any, any Swedish to, to become employed in that school, which is Finnish speaking. So, so in, this, in this case, actually, uh, the, the educational system um, makes an exception to the general frame of the Language Act, which distributes the municipalities in bilingual and, 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 and monolingual, and in principle requires a municipality to respond in either of the languages. Educational system responds in one of the languages, depending on the language of the child. I will not go into this um, a decision by the Supreme Administrative Court uh, on the road signs and names of, of road signs, except to say that um, a municipality which is bilingual must have bilingual road signs throughout the municipality, no matter where in that municipality the Swedish speakers might live. Uh, those road signs have to be bilingual in the total, uh, in the entire territory of the municipality, not just in that perhaps uh, one part where a minority, a uh, Swedish-speaking population might live. Uh, so that's, uh, that's uh, the case, just as an example for what this could mean. Uh, there's a second sentence in section 17 which introduces a collective dimension uh, to the cohabitation of the two linguistic groups. Uh, the public authority shall provide for the cultural and societal needs of the Finnish-speaking and Swedish-speaking population of, of the country on an equal basis. Where there is not an, an individual right implied, actually, then uh, also in those situations the state has to do something, not only the state but also public authorities in general, uh, including the lawmaker. Um, public authorities is a broad, broad term here, includes the parliament, different public bodies, municipalities, and, 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 and this has resulted into linguistic rules about vertical and horizontal relationships of all sorts, um, which is uh, perhaps uh, another consequence of this uh, principle of national languages. Um, what you want to make sure is that both languages can be used in the society, not only in relation to the public authorities, but also horizontally. Uh, when you, for instance, want to have uh, your insurance uh, matters dealt with, perhaps some consumer protection issues between, between the producer of a, of, a, of a piece of goods and, 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 the, and, the, and the person who buys, um, and, and, and so on. And sometimes, in fact, the European Union uh, law requires from member states that the member state provides these rules that regard consumers 
of all sorts of products and services in the official languages of the state, which might not always be the, 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 the official language of, of the European Union. In the Finnish case, of course, this is very easy because Swedish also is an official language of the European Union, so it's, uh, it should be normal. But the point here with the second sentence, I believe, is that that, that there should be de, not only de jure, but also de facto equality between the two language groups. And this is um, the topic of, uh, of a case from the Supreme Administrative Court from 2004, which dealt with a municipal decision to switch uh, um, a, a hospital region from, of a municipality from Helsinki region to uh, 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 an, a region in the inner Finland. And this municipality was bilingual. While uh, making that decision to switch from Helsinki to, to, to the other region uh, for, for financial reasons, because healthcare in Helsinki was so expensive, the municipal council at the same time made the decision uh, to allow the Swedish speakers continue using the special healthcare in the Helsinki region. Whereupon a Finnish speaker in that municipality complained to the administrative court and said, this is discrimination. The Swedish speaker should also go to this uh, same um, hospital that we are sent to now after the switch. And they should uh, not go to, to, the, to, the, to the Helsinki. Um, the Supreme Administrative Court found that this uh, provision actually tries to um, maintain a de facto equality between the linguistic groups and therefore allowed this uh, uh, municipal decision. Um, and uh, hence, the Finnish speakers go to one hospital, which is to the inner part of Finland. The Swedish speakers continue to go to the, to the Helsinki hospitals because they, those hospitals for sure can provide the services in Swedish. Um, so special measures of all sorts, either through law and, and this, in this uh, context through the Supreme Administrative Court, can be, can be permitted uh, in order to reach de facto equality. There's also a provision uh, in Section 17 on other groups, the Sami, recognized as an indigenous people, as well as the Roma and other groups, including then, uh, and this is the right of the group, I will not uh, talk about this to a greater extent, but there is legislation also on the Sami, as we, as we can see from here in the next uh, sentence of the same subsection. Provisions on the right of the Sami to use the Sami language before the authorities are laid by down an, by an act. How easy is it for a country where two national languages are already recognized to add on uh, new groups and to give more rights by law. Well, it's probably less complicated than in France or Greece or somewhere. No? It's easier to, to, to say that, well, let's, let's do it for the Sami as well. Five minutes left. I'm far from being <laughs> closing this. Okay, I'll try to do my best. There's a Sami Language Act, which actually makes, uh, makes, um, makes Sami an official language in the northernmost part of Finland in relation to those public authorities which are, uh, which are uh, active there, state and municipal authorities, which means that, uh, which means that uh, yes, there's a kind of an, a similar setup with the Sami languages in that part of Finland, as is uh, uh, modeled for the two national languages in the rest of the country. Uh, there's an act of basic education, in addition, that recognizes the Sami, also the act on childcare and so on. Around 84 norms that uh, in Finland, the acts of parliament and decrees of the government that speak about the Sami and the, the rights. Um, I won't go into, into that um, to any greater extent, except that they are, main, they are on the vertical relationship between the individual and, and the authority. And there's also recognition of the sign language. And here, interestingly, uh, the principle of the national languages come, comes through in an interesting way. Sign language is not singular in Finland. There are two different sign languages actually uh, recognized in the, in the act on sign language, the Finnish sign language and the Finland-Swedish sign language. There must also be 
So there's a parallel regulation for that. But again, only for the vertical relationship. We find regulations on that, but not for the horizontal. Then there's an important provision, which is, context, uh, which is right now under interpretation in Finland, Section 122 on administrative divisions. When the administration is organi organized in one way or the other, the objective shall be, shall be suitable territorial division so that the Finnish-speaking and Swedish po populations have an opportunity to receive services in their own language on equal terms. Here, there is no requirement of an act of parliament, but this should apply to the lawmaker, but also to the government, the Council of State, when giving decrees where the country is... Uh, is, is split up into different jurisdictions for different authorities. I cannot now, due to lack of time, go into an interpretation that the Supreme Administrative Court said in 2012, uh, except that I just pointed out uh, when these sort of administrative organizations are done that affect the jurisdictions of, of the regional and local government, there should be a linguistic impact assessment a linguistic impact assessment. What are the consequences for the Finnish-speaking and the Swedish-speaking population in that area? Then the Åland Islands is a particular place. I already mentioned it. It was up to discussion in the League of Nations, and that's, everybody knows about the Åland Islands settlement. But not very many know about the other uh, discussion, which was the discussion on, on national languages and, and, and uh, equality of, of, of different groups. Um, under the self-government act of the Åland, the Åland Islands is unilingual, only Swedish-speaking, uh, as concerns uh, the official structures. And this actually makes an exception to the bilingualism of the constitution. This, bilingualism, uh, this monolingualism or unilingualism in the Åland Islands is not, I underline, is not the consequence of the 1921 settlement before the League of Nations. But it's a, it's a kind of a domestic creation that Holland Island should be Swedish-speaking. However, there is one linguistic provision in particular in this Holland Island settlement of 1921 which deals with, uh, with, the, Holland, with the Holland Islands, namely the requirement that uh, only uh, schools that use Swedish be uh, receiving public funding. However, there is... Uh, there is a right for a, an individual to use Finnish when approaching state authorities that are active within the Åland Islands, such as the courts of law and the tax office and, and, and the customs and so on. Comments on Finland. Nationalism? A mild variant, perhaps not. The, the normal way to organize a state back in 1920 was to, to, to organize the state uh, under the principle of nationalism. One people, one state, one language. That's it. And, and the rest, whatever languages they spoke, they wouldn't have to be cared about. In Finland, uh, the organizational principle was different. One people, one state, but two languages. This has been uh, followed up by constitutional continuity. There was some activity already pre-1919, but from 1919 through 1995 with the constitutional rights reform uh, to the constitution uh, that entered into force uh, in 2000, uh, there is continuity in this philosophy. Um, and for that reason, I believe Finland together with uh, Switzerland, Canada, Ireland, Belgium, Singapore, South Africa, Bolivia, and a number of other countries can be placed in a, in a separate category which um, organizes its existence, existence in another way than most other countries in the world. This is a category of countries, however, which is increasing in numbers rather than diminishing. Uh, other countries are uh, in the second category, for instance, recognizing that there exist minorities in their area. Uh, or then there's a third category that doesn't exist yet. That, that doesn't recognize that there exist any minorities. So I think uh, this first category is the one which we are studying during this conference, and I congratulate you to, to, to so to say, um, taking out this category and, and making the comparison within that category of countries. This is precisely how it should be. Finland is in, in category one. Many other categories are there as well. 
And I think those countries in that first category can be generous to languages, languages in, in, in plurals, not just uh, generous in relation to one language, but, but to several languages. The future. Of course, there's a threat from, from uh, nationalism in Finland. The 300,000 or so speakers of Swedish um, are not always that happy about, uh, about how their linguistic rights are being, uh, being um, uh, implemented. The tax authorities are very good at that, 100% uh, success in uh, applying the linguistic rights when collecting taxes from Finnish speakers and Swedish speakers alike. But then we get uh, areas where implementation is less good, such as um, healthcare and, and, and so on. Educational system is working well in, in the two, uh, two languages. I think the numbers, nonetheless, don't warrant the conclusion that, that Finland needs to go down as a bilingual country. Iceland has 300,000 or so inhabitants, and they succeed in making a whole country run with, in Icelandic. Why not? Uh, why couldn't the Finnish state uh, do the same with two languages, where one of the languages has the same number, more or less, as Island, Iceland has in terms of population? Thank you very much for your interest. I'm sorry I dragged on speaking too long, but... Uh, Thank you uh, very much. Bé, moltes gràcies, professor Succi. Bé, sobre aquesta experiència 